Well, good afternoon. I am Nikki Lunsford, part of a researching team to figure out what's going on with our churches and how that impacts our lives in Muncie, Indiana, and culturally overall. It's December 21st, and we're in Bracken Library. So Matt Carter from Common Way Church and a friend for several years, um, I've got a few questions to ask you. Sure. All right. First of all, Matt, tell us about your faith journey and how you became a pastor and how you came to be in the position you now occupy. Sure. Uh, I actually grew up, I was pretty involved in a, a church. Um, my dad was a pastor and you know, it's a funny thing, you kind of, so I grew up kind of experiencing church world from the inside like mm -hmm. that. Um, my dad, you know, basically said, whatever you do, don't don't do this. <laughs> he was <laughs> encouraging me not to do that. So I don't know how that factored into my mm -hmm. ultimate decision to pursue that. But at some point between my late last few years of high school, I felt like that was something oh. that started to resonate with me. Okay. You know, people talk about calling and yep. what they're supposed to be supposed to do with their lives and mm -hmm. just had the sense that that was my path. And so then I went to uh, Indiana Wesleyan up in Marion to do my undergrad in that and then look for you know options once I graduated so good and that's where you met Liz yep met my wife Liz at Indiana Wesleyan and then that was you know we met and then I took a year off to travel I did the backpack trip around the world thing mm -hmm. um, and then came back and we had we were looking at a church plant uh, joining a church plant with some friends in Manhattan we looked oh. at at missions in South America and then we ended up you know we had some conversations with some folks here and long story short we've been in Muncie for about 13 or 14 years now. So what drew you to Muncie away from Manhattan missions and I know it's crazy <laughs> <laughs> we really I really didn't think especially after traveling and having grown up in Indiana just didn't think that we'd end up here um, I suppose it's just the, we had some connections with some folks here and you know when you're exploring job alternatives, you have a conversation and you explore with other people mm -hmm. you're having conversations with and there are things that happen that seem to yeah. close some of those doors yeah. and then you kind of keep having the conversation that it just keeps taking the next step and yeah. so it didn't feel like any dramatic epiphany. Okay. It was just, it felt like we felt we would say we felt like we had peace about being here. And Liz's family is, of course, from here, yeah. and so that was also, that's also a good thing, you know? Right. Yeah. Especially right. as we've had kids, and it's been, her family's yeah. great, so. And your family's four My hours family's, away. Yeah, three, so, three or four hours So away, it's still yeah. kind of mm -hmm. local. So how did you come to be in the position you're in now? So in 2003, I was hired on at Union Chapel, a United Methodist Church here in Muncie. Mm -hmm. And I was hired to be their young adult pastor. Mm -hmm. And this is back in the late, probably the late 1990s, early 2000s. A lot of churches that were larger, you know, larger churches around the country were doing what they called specifically young adult ministry. Right. And what that meant was, in many cases, a, a weekend worship service for 20-somethings. Mm -hmm. And so that was, I mean, that was their vision. They hired me to do that. And I was essentially coordinating it. I led the music and was basically the administration and behind the scenes person. Uh, and the senior pastor of Union Chapel uh, came over, kind of like one of their other weekend services. It was just that this one was for young adults, different music, different okay. space, different atmosphere, mm -hmm. you know. Well, what happened with us, as it was also true with most of these other ministries around the country, is that at some point, everybody turns 30, right? <laughs> it happens. <laughs> and then, you know, it raises the question, well, we're doing some things a little bit differently. Right. Uh, and what happens when we all turn 30? Do we start a 30-something service? It, yeah. it raises some philosophical challenges. Yeah. And another one was we discovered, like other people, that a lot of 20-year-olds or 25-year-olds, they, they don't want to, you know, they want to be, they can benefit from, from spending time with people of all ages yeah. I mean, and vice mm -hmm. versa. So you really right. lose out on that intergenerational, mm -hmm. multi-generational uh, dynamic. 
And so about a year and a half in, we actually just made it, we decided, we kind of saw the writing on the wall with, this is gonna create some problems. And so we, we ended up uh, making a transition to basically a, like a, a partner church or a sister church, or for lack of a better term, a, a church within a church almost mm -hmm. of Union Chapel. And, and the senior pastor kind of stepped out of it. I, I took the lead, was doing the, the teaching, preaching on a regular basis. Uh, we ended up having our own leadership team and small groups and just all the kind of life of the church. Right. And so to fast forward, this was about an eight year process. We continued to grow and to develop. Mm -hmm. And over that time, we began having conversations. We continued having conversations the whole time, just basically saying, where is this going? Mm -hmm. And there was a, a couple of different options. One being, and we knew this from the beginning, to send this young sort of adolescent uh, group of people, I mean, we weren't, we weren't adolescents, but just in our formation, you know, right. to send us out on our own, you know, to kick the teenager out of the nest, mm -hmm. right? Right. That was one option. Another one was to uh, try to pull the plug on it and kind of get both groups back together. And we, we, we basically explored all the alternatives that we could come up with and concluded at the end of the day for where we were, it was probably best just to say, this thing's growing. It's, it's, it's obviously meeting a different need than what the, mm -hmm. the Union Chapel, the church, you know, they're reaching a different group of people. Mm -hmm. So let's cut them loose and, and let them do their thing. And so that was obviously, that's a short story. Right. Uh, that wasn't without its challenges. You know, you can imagine relationally and what, what you know, some of the implications there. Um, but we, you know, we're, we were really appreciative of Union Chapel for, in a sense, incubating us, mm -hmm. right, as a church, mm -hmm. as a group. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so yeah, so. And by the time you launched, you had multi-generation, didn't yeah, you? For, you are really, for three or four years there, we'd had all ages. We had 80-year-olds coming to our, sort of our service or our group. Mm -hmm. Down um, to infants. Yeah, down to infants and young, right. young families and stuff, so. So really had taken on a life of its own. It really did, and that was, I suppose, one of the things we, we even said, uh, I remember these conversations with the Union Chapel leadership team. You start things like this and you don't always, you kind of think, well, what if this doesn't work? Right. Because that's always a risk. Mm -hmm. The one question we never asked was, what if it does work? Yeah. And where does that go? And so I suppose there was some things, you know, it, it was just kind of a domino effect. And we yeah. didn't probably see all that at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. But you get to a place where it's like, this, this is where we are. And yeah. people are responding. And, you know, what are we going to do next? And so that was in the summer of 2011. We launched out as an independent church. And we met at the, we meet still at the, at the convention center in downtown Muncie. Okay. So I can feel those pains of a teenager and their parent wanting mm -hmm. to. Yeah, that's right. Keep growing. Yeah. So how does that look? How does the church look at, at the Horizon Center in common? At, uh, because that means you don't have a weekly office. You no. don't have a chapel. Somebody can go in and, and no. pray in the middle of the week. How does that look? Well, very non-traditional. Mm -hmm. in, in every sense of if anybody's grown up in a, a church, you know, with a, a building on a corner. Mm -hmm. We don't have space, you know, really for stuff during the week. Uh, mm -hmm. We rent the convention center on Sunday morning for about three or four hours, including set up and tear down. In some ways, I mean, I think a lot of people would look at that as like, that would be a real negative. And in a lot of ways, I think we've come to, to see that as a, as a mostly positive thing because it keeps us from being dependent on a building. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you know, having mm -hmm. a, having a, most churches have a, that have a, a physical property, most of the time those buildings sit empty. Yes. And then there's deferred maintenance costs and mm -hmm. things associated with, with that. And again, not that we won't ever have a building someday or that, not that that's bad, but it's really freed us for the first five years to focus on our interactions with people mm -hmm. and hopefully mm -hmm. to be out in the community and uh, to make the most of what we have without, it's just how you look at it. Yeah. And we, we try yes. to look at it as a, as a positive. Okay. The, the, thing, the other thing I'll say there is that is nice from a, I like being a part of the, you know, the convention center and their business. Yeah. Um, of course, they're, they have events all week long. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the very room that we're in on Sundays. Right. They don't, as of right now, have a whole lot of, a whole lot of events going on in all the rooms at least. They have room on Sunday morning. That's the, that's the least busy day of the week for them. Right. 
that's the one day of the week that we need it. And so in a lot of ways, it just, it's, it's been just a good, good, it's been a good partnership. And they have really, um, it's really extended our, the, the model of uh, portable church. Mm -hmm. It's, we've been able to do it for as long as we have, largely because of the services that they provide. So we don't have to set up all the chairs. It's really saved a lot of the wear and tear on volunteers. And you have like a closet where and then you we have keep permanent most of your stuff? There, a, large, a large room, mm -hmm. so we keep the stuff we do have to set up. Is We're not trailering it in every Sunday in February and, and all that, so yeah. Good. So it's been good. What do you see as your main <clears throat> responsibilities? Personally, I see to uh, basically to oversee the vision and the direction of the church and to keep that in front of people mm -hmm. and to, to make sure we're moving in the, in the right direction, I yeah. suppose. Um, yeah. So back to our mission is to uh, invite people to find hope in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanna make sure that we're doing that with, okay. with the initiatives, the, the opportunities that come up. It's my job to remind people of that, um, yeah. you know, uh, along the way. I, the other, I think, large responsibility that I have is, to, is the teaching or preaching or sermon or message or whatever yeah. your tradition calls it mm -hmm. on Sunday morning, which for us ends up being about 30 or 40 minutes uh, different traditions give that a different place and our, our tradition seems to weight that he pretty heavily in terms mm -hmm. of time on a Sunday morning. So yeah, so we've got about a 30, 35 minute message that I prepare every Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's another, that takes a big chunk of my time. Big you know? chunk, mm -hmm. because that's so important. Mm -hmm. um, how would you characterize the condition of your church or your your population is it growing is it mm -hmm. declining is yeah. it young we have there Sunday I saw all those kids on <laughs> stage right. and it's yeah. like yeah there's a lot of kids I would say our overall um, we, we've kind of hit a plateau lately with our overall attendance mm -hmm. it, four to five hundred people depending on the Sunday and there's you know you have uh, holidays and things in there where it, we, we tend to have a group of people that is feels pretty free to take a Sunday off, you know, or do other <laughs> things. And so I don't know what would happen if everybody actually showed up. And I'm sure that's true for most churches, but it seems like we do have a fairly young congregation and a lot of people travel and have activities and kids, have, there's all that stuff yeah. that kids have on Sundays yeah. now yeah. with their involved in sports and traveling. And so overall attendance, this is an, an interesting, interesting trend has, you know, basically been the same the last probably two years, but our children's attendance has gone up by like 30%. And it took me a second to figure out what does that mean because the kids can't drive to church by themselves. And so I'm trying to figure out, and I think what's happened is as young adults or people move away or graduate, right. we've replaced them with, because we do have a lot of turnover every single year with people that graduate and move. Okay. I think we've replaced them, quote unquote, with people with kids, like with young, young families. families. So the kind of the downstairs or in the main auditorium, that's about, been about the same for a few years. But we've seen, you know, a pretty big jump in the kids that's been consistent and kind of keeps pushing that that limit. So did anybody count how many kids were up there on Sunday? I don't I don't I don't know. I know that it had to be up yeah. to fifty. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it was. Yeah, <laughs> elementary kids, yeah. That's not even the littlest ones. <laughs> Recent research has suggested that some churches have had difficulty attracting and keeping members. Has this been the case for your church? You mentioned that they're coming mm -hmm. and they're going. Do you think they're I mean you're a non denominational, right? Right. Yeah, I like to say interdenominational. Okay, but I like I'm that. not just because of what, we didn't actively seek to be non. Yes. But it just that's where we ended up, and we mm -hmm. do have people from lots of different backgrounds, mm -hmm. um, really across the spectrum. So, yeah. Um, so as far as attracting, keeping members, like you said, there's that natural turnover, and I think that's. I don't know if that's a, a monthly thing, uh, or if that's common in any community where there's a university or people get their degree or their master's degree mm -hmm. and then move on. Uh, that's probably one of the hardest things about my role is I develop these relationships with people for three, four, or five years, and then then they go. And I see that as kind of part of my role yeah. to invest in people and to, to build those relationships, but I can tell when I'm tired because I'll meet somebody new and think, was the, back at the beginning of this. You know what I mean? Like I've yes, done this a, a few times done now. Done this, yeah. Are you going to get back in this? Yeah. And so yeah. to recognize that's just part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for the most part, 
uh, I've been pleased with our ability to attract people. We don't, because we don't have a permanent facility, that means we don't have any visibility. You can't drive you don't. by. You can't drive and to so Common the only, Way. No. And so you either, you either hear about it from a friend, and that's, uh -huh. I always ask people that are new, I, when I meet them, I'll say, well, how'd you find out about this? You hear about it from a friend, or, and this is the other thing that, and this has surprised me, is people like our website. And what people hmm. do is if they don't know somebody, they'll just Google churches in Muncie. Oh. And then they will literally judge based on the appeal of the website to that person. Interesting. And what it looks like and the vibe that they get and that kind of thing. So I've been, that's, that's been an interesting thing where that's actually helped us. That would attract your younger people. I suppose so, yeah. 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 So aside from the membership, what are the key challenges facing Common Way community? I think, um, you know, the facility question is always people that comes up every year. What are we going to do? Is this going to be a long term? What's the next thing? So that's something we've continued to be mindful of. Yeah. The other side of that is the situation could at any point change with the convention center if they started okay. getting more business with yeah. the hotel and all that. You know, it's their it's their priority to bring economic development to downtown. It is. We're not really that, you know, we don't, so, <laughs> uh, so I totally understand. So that could change, so far it hasn't, but if they picked up on Sunday and started, if we started getting kicked out on Sunday mornings, we'd have to, that would really cause us to think about the situation. Yeah. Um, and just in general, you think about other things that you wanna be able to do with youth or children, and the question just, it does, it does come up, facility-wise, will, will we be here forever? Mm -hmm. That's a challenge. I, I think we're in a good place. I like where we are, but it's always a tension that we live with. I can see where it'd be almost like, are we going to meet the promised land when we finally get our? <laughs> That's <facility>? right. <laughs> well, there is. There is. I. I'm actually maybe more okay with the mm -hmm. situation as it is than some other people. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think there is something about your sense of place mm -hmm. that we don't quite have. Right. I mean, we're almost there. You know, like mm -hmm. you know. One more step and we'd be there, but I think that's that's probably the piece that we that some people perhaps feel like we're missing. Okay. And I, I can understand that. Another challenge is just figuring out how to how to staff the church and we've you know, as we've grown and I guess matured in some ways mm -hmm. over the past five years. I mean we put systems in place and developed our children's ministry and then our youth ministry and we're working on college ministry mm -hmm. and these different sort of uh, big parts of what we're doing. Then it raises the question, is this a volunteer-led group? Right. Is this a part-time staff, full-time staff? Mm -hmm. So I feel like I've had to learn a lot about um, just what does that look like? What are the options? How do other people do that? Obviously, we have limited resources, like anybody. The business side of it. That's, that's right. The business that's right. side. Right. That's been the most challenging part for me, I suppose, is just uh, the management. Right. You know, staff right. management and policies, and you think about well, what, you know, insurance and HR stuff. I mean, all that stuff you don't think about being a part of a church, but, but it you is. have employees and you have, right. you know, kids in the building mm -hmm. and you have, you want to protect them and you, all kinds of stuff that you, mm -hmm. I didn't fully appreciate until <laughs> <laughs> we had to develop that over the last five years. So that's interesting. Yeah. Well, what role do you see Common Way taking in the wider community? That's a great question. I really like the fact that we're downtown, mm -hmm. um, and again, I don't know if that will always be the case. I don't see us going out to the suburbs mm -hmm. and building a new facility on you know 30 acres of farmland out somewhere else. Right. I really, number one, I don't think that's the best use for us of of money in general. Mm -hmm. But number two, I like being I like being where the people are. Mm -hmm. I like the sense of life and that there's stuff happening and even the, the way that downtown's been redeveloping the last, I mean, dramatically different in the mm -hmm. last five years that, since we've been there. Absolutely. Because we, we know because we've dealt with the construction traffic, <laughs> right? <laughs> so how are you gonna get there? Well, you know, streets blocked yeah. off and one ways right. and all that. Um, so I, I really wanna see us, and I, I suppose this is part of our, at, this, at, at least at this season, we don't have any overhead other than our okay. rent. I mean, our, our, our expenses are fixed. We mm -hmm. know at the beginning of the year what they're gonna be. Okay. Um, and so I, I hope that that gives us some freedom to take some risks in terms of, of organizations that we support and ways that we try to help the community. I think the other thing that 
all our leadership team, and I, I'm talking like I make all these decisions myself, and I don't. We have a, right. a board that governs and you know all that. But we decided, at least for the, for this season, but from starting out, that we didn't want to reinvent the wheel with uh, other uh, with the work that was being done in the community. Mm-hmm. To whether it's with the poor or kids or education, that a we don't know enough. We're not experts in any of these fields, mm-hmm. and. And so B, there are people who are doing that much better. And so how can we figure out what those groups are and where we might be able to fit into that? Mm-hmm. And so we have spent a lot of time, our, our board, uh, thinking about, you're familiar obviously with top, topics like toxic charity or mm-hmm. when you, you, know, you mean well, but yes. it doesn't solve the root problem or doesn't right. seem to get beneath the surface. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so we've tried to be cautious and careful uh, with with the groups that we, looking for organizations that are doing that, that are involved relationally, that are empowering to other, to the mm-hmm. people they're trying to serve, mm-hmm. and that have a, a long-term view of, of what they're trying to accomplish. So, mm-hmm. so at this point, we are, you know, we support a number of organizations. We, are, we have a mentoring program at Longfellow Elementary. We've okay. done that for several years where we have people from the church mentoring mm-hmm. one-on-one. And I just I actually just came from there before this. Oh, okay. So, um, you know, and I've been doing that for, for a long time. We have uh, other, just other organizations that we support with volunteers and mm-hmm. with financially. Uh, one of the things that we try to do or we've made the commitment to do is to give away at least 10% of the income yes. the offering, you know, that comes in. And it's to these organizations. All right. Uh, largely locally and then we have some globally as well. So. Right. Right. In the last few decades, which is more than you guys have even been around, right. I mean you, but mm-hmm. um, Muncie has seen a huge economic and um, social change. Mm-hmm. C- uh, companies leaving mm-hmm. the whole, it's, it's just totally been turned upside down. In what ways have these changes, do you see these changes having impacted your church? I suppose the, the biggest thing is something I've already alluded to, which is people graduating, uh, in, in areas and degrees in fields where there's no there are no jobs there's no jobs and so I, and you've noticed people even get to certain places in a company here in, a, in an organization and there's no more room for them and so then they so for one of those two reasons end up moving out of the community uh, yeah. uh, I suppose that's the the biggest thing and, mm-hmm. and like you said I wasn't I don't have a huge before and after experience to contrast to right. compare but I think that is a direct result of that. Mm-hmm. Well, is your faith community is, is, is common way involved in the life of the community socially or economically? And has that commitment mm-hmm. changed over the last five years? Yeah, I mean, we're involved with, I mean, a, probably at least a dozen other nonprofits that we support mm-hmm. at a relational level and then that we give monthly, uh, we give monthly money to. I think we've given, I don't want to say, but it's a couple hundred thousand dollars that we've given away since we've started um, and again trying to find it, it's not always easy to find the, those organizations I, I think there's lots of great organizations yes. in Muncie yes. but to find ones that also have that background and that common goal of empowering mm-hmm. and not just kind of putting a band-aid on not just on feeding the, it out mm-hmm, that's right so mm-hmm. that takes time to build those relationships yes and to, to do that research and again we're not a we have a small staff and you know small kind of group to, to do that kind of legwork right has taken us some time mm-hmm. well you mentioned the it was that kids hope where you kids do the hope, mentoring that's, one that's the one that you have you initiated any other like coming straight out of common way just from a need initiated any programs into the community uh you know we we tried to we've done some community service days in the old west end Okay. Where we do Saturday neighborhood cleanups. The neighborhood, that's something that is important to some of the folks in that neighborhood. And so yeah. they, they kind of start with a grassroots group. And then we come along and we say, you know, if you had 50 more people to help on a Saturday. And so th- we've done that several times. And so that's something that, and that's right out the back door of, our, mm-hmm. of the convention center. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's been good. We just did a thing called Help Portrait at Southside Middle School mm-hmm. where we invited people to come we had professional photographers and makeup and hair people and nice. families or individuals show up and they get their 
they get their family portrait taken, Aww. and then we, we print the pictures right there on site and hand them to them. And it just, I mean, I know everybody has a cell phone and for the most part can, but to have a professional, all your family right. put together, you know, there. Right. And it, it happens every time where people say, we've never done this before. We don't have a picture of all of us and or you know whatever but that's that's a pretty neat it and is. that's part of another national even global movement of, okay. of groups that do that as well but okay. so that's at Southside Middle School we've you know we do food drives and, and lots of things with Southside as well as Longfellow Elementary School and that's something they can hold forever and remember that love that's so right. does common way have an alliance with any other um, faith organizations or Groups, yeah. yeah. Well, for sure, several of the churches, the downtown churches. I'm, and I think that's probably a lot to do with my friendship with the other pastors in the, you know, First Baptist or the Jar or the okay. Bridge. I mean, you know, you kind of get to know these men and women, um, and so there's those kinds of, but those are informal, you okay. know, largely. I, I suppose we've had a couple of times in the past where we've. We've had a dinner at First Baptist for Good. people that we were serving, okay. and they're very gracious to open up their space to us. So there is that kind of collaborating that goes on All right. um, with some of that. And then we've worked over the years with, with Inside Out, um, probably have a, a pretty strong relationship with them in terms of our, our past. Um, I know I'm forgetting some. There's several that we, we just support. One of the things that we do too, because we, again, we don't have people stopping in off the street right because we don't have a that happens to most downtown churches uh, people will sometimes call they'll find our, our number you know in the phone book or through Facebook or something and people looking for more immediate assistance and going back to what I said earlier we want to be we want to meet the needs that are legitimate but we also right. know there's a whole bigger thing going on there yeah. so we basically support um, Christian Ministries and Muncie Mission and we just direct those folks there and say you know, we support these people who are more equipped to make these kinds mm -hmm. of decisions and to disperse mm -hmm. these kinds of funds. So we're not, it's just one less thing for us to administrate. Right. You know, and they're so. already doing it well. And they're already doing it well. According, yeah. yeah, so that's, that's let them do what do. they do. And, that's right. All right. So what rule, if any, do you see for churches and faith communities mm -hmm. in cultivating a sense of citizenship among their members? Mm -hmm. Can you, you see, that one time? Yeah. What role, if any, do you see that churches and faith communities in cultivating a sense of citizenship among their members, and do you see a connection between their faith and their citizenship? As far as cultivating citizenship, one of the things I, I really, one of my favorite things about our church is the fact that there are people who are, have every Sunday morning are sitting across the aisle or whatever rows who have pretty vastly different political beliefs, <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> uh, preferences, I mean, you name it. And for an hour, an hour and 15 minutes on Sunday, we can be together. And I don't think we're diminishing the degree to which we differ. I don't think we're downplaying that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think they're real. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are some things that are mutually exclusive, right? Mm -hmm. um, but for an hour and 15 minutes, we're not, nobody's fighting, nobody's getting nasty, you know, with comments on Facebook, mm -hmm. um, that we're able to love each other and mm -hmm. to respect each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that gives me hope. It does, it you does. Know? And it's not because we're ignorant of each other's views. I mean, I think people recognize mm -hmm. there's that, it's, it's there. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that is a, is a it is. if it can be done here, maybe it could be done on a larger scale, right? right? Yeah, but I think if I'm not badly mistaken, you have touched some pretty touchy subjects yeah. about citizenship sort of things uh -huh. from your position. Talk about that a minute. I, yeah. Thinking of a couple examples. Right. I think, um, I think as a pastor, my personal philosophy is nothing is off limits as long as you fully appreciate the, what you're handling. I think where pastors get themselves in trouble is where they think that they understand something and just kind of spout off something, a cliche or a platitude about r religion or, or faith mm -hmm. or whatever, taking a side on an issue. And they're, the way that they talk about that makes it very clear they don't have a full, 
the other side doesn't feel heard at all. They feel diminished or disrespected or condescended to. Yes. Yes. And so, again, and I, I, I don't have a death wish, right? But I think, <laughs> I think for me, I, I really, I'd like to believe I'm not afraid to talk about anything. I think it's making sure that I have the perspective and I get input from other people um, to A, to do justice to both sides. Mm -hmm. And B, I, you know, at the end of the day, back to our mission, our, our, our role is to invite people to focus on Jesus, to find life in Him. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's my ultimate, ultimate goal. And so sometimes that means uh, refusing, to the t refusing the terms of the question as it's presented to me, mm -hmm. <laughs> this or that, this mm -hmm. or that. I, I refuse that, I refuse that. Because I don't, I, I think it puts me in a place where uh, now we're talking politics, mm -hmm. and now I've taken a side, and now I've endorsed this and not that. And so I, I know this, this is all very nuanced and obviously um, sometimes difficult. But at the end of the day, I want people to, to focus on Jesus. The motion, the, the, the mission. That's right. And therefore the relational attributes yep. of that mission and how that That's manifests right. itself in the community. Yep. Is that kind of? That's right. And so I, I try to run everything through that lens of, will this help with that? Yeah. Uh, and try to take myself out of it as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything else you wish to add? Churches, communities. I am encouraged, you know, I, I've, I've only been here for 13 or 14 years, uh -huh. and I don't know, I am, I kind of have the, the benefit of being ignorant about a lot of things that perhaps happen politically <laughs> in the community, right? I mean, I'm, okay. I'm just enough outside of that. I'm involved, but I'm not, I'm not involved in the, really the politics or anything like that. I guess what I'm saying is sometimes people, I, I get the feeling, are a little bit cynical about that. Or you think about the, um, you know, I don't know how churches have related to each other or been, you know, we're, we're this is our thing, you stay over there. I, all, all I'm trying to say is I have found the pastors that I know, speaking yes. about the world that I do know a little bit about, yeah. have been very open about um, working together. I, I think, I think there's, a, there's a bigger desire to, to work together, to serve the community, and that's not the question. The question is how can we, how can we direct that effort I think if somebody came along with a plan of like this is something that all churches could do, uh, I think there's a lot of a lot of pastors who would be who would jump on board. It wouldn't be a political resistance um, or a territorial type thing. Mm -hmm. it, so that's been my experience. And again, some of these pastors are, are younger, mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's maybe that's part of it. Maybe it's some more non-denominational churches. So there's not that some of that. Um, sense of loyalty to a denomination right. over, you know, so I, I don't know. Do you think that may, maybe makes you less threatening? Because I, you don't have a physical space, therefore I, you don't have a... I suppose, Or yeah. you don't have, yeah, I'm not a Methodist, I'm not a Presbyterian, that's right. that's I'm right. just... That, and that's been one of the good things about being at the convention center is people have been there for non-church things. They've been there for parties, they've been there for True. receptions, they've been there for community True. fundraising events. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just, it's not a threatening place in the sense of... You know, what the, you know what the place is going to look like when you walk in, so right. that's, that's a nice thing. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much. You're thank welcome. you for your time, and thank you for your service to the community of Muncie Absolutely. and to your beliefs. Thanks so much.